Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to CoachX Live with the Institute of Coaching. My name is Jeffrey Hull. I'm the Executive Director of the Institute of Coaching, and I am super excited to be here once again. She is one of our um, number two guests on CoachX Live because she's been with us before. But my dear friend and uh, favorite thought leader of the Institute of Coaching, Sally Helgeson, is with us here today. Yes, Sally has a wonderful new book out called Rising Together, How We Can Bridge Divides and Create a More Inclusive Workplace. So we are super happy. I am super happy to be able to spend this short, wonderful little dialogue with Sally today. And um, I want to just say hello to everyone and check to make sure people are able to come in and say hi from wherever you are. So it's good afternoon or good evening or good morning from wherever you are. Um, so please, in the comments section, say hi, and we will pay attention to your comments and try to get to your questions as much as we can during our short, short time together. So for those of you that are not familiar with Sally Helgeson, and I bet there are very few, but for those of you that are not, let me just give you a quick background. Um, Sally is one of the world's premier experts on women's leadership, and I would say leadership in general, cited in Forbes as the world's premier expert on war, women's leadership. She's a best-selling author, a speaker, a leadership coach herself. She's been inducted into the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame, which honors those whose ideas have shaped the field of leadership worldwide. And she's ranked number three among the world's thought leaders by global gurus. So she's definitely a top thought leader in her space. And as I said, a dear friend of the Institute of Coaching. And she had remarkable success with her book that was co-written by our other favorite executive coach and thought leader, Marshall Goldsmith, How Women Rise. And she follows that up with this new book, Rising Together, How Can Bridge Divides and Create a More Inclusive Workplace? So I am not gonna go on with a long introduction because I could, she has a long history of having written multiple best-selling books, but I really wanna welcome you, Sally, and be able to dive right into our conversation. Thank you, Jeff, it's wonderful to be with you again. So I'm seeing people come in. So folks are here. Maria's here all the way from Greece. So we definitely have a connection to the world. Hi, Maria. <laughs> and uh, say hello from wherever you are. But Sally, let's get started uh, with a little background because I think people, um, many folks are familiar with your writing career and a number of the books that you've written all the way back to the Female Advantage and the Web of Inclusion and more recently, How Women Rise. So perhaps the best place to start would be some of your thoughts on how that transitioned for you over the past few years into this new theme of rising together and the current book. Certainly, Jeff. You know, I've been, um, although I'm well known for women's leadership, I've also been working in inclusive leadership now for nearly 30 years. Uh, with the book, The Web of Inclusion was the first time the language of inclusion was used in, in the workplace. So when I wrote that book, uh, diversity and inclusion wasn't a thing. They hadn't been paired yet, but right. that happened a number of years later. So because of, of that book, uh, companies began bringing me in to work with them on creating a more inclusive culture. So it's been my, you know, I've had this twin focus all along. But the way I got the idea for Rising Together was I was doing a, um, a, a women's leadership workshop at the Construction Super Conference in Las Vegas. <laughs> in, I know. In Construction Super Conference. I love exactly. that. So there were about 6,000 people there. Wow. You know, probably 5,000 700 of them were men. And um, I, I was surprised that they wanted a women's leadership segment, breakout. It was basically a breakout. So I said yes, and I went out to Las Vegas. And I asked them, what, what should I expect in terms of participants? And they said, well, based on last year, which was our first time we did this, we would say probably 100 women who are struggling to make their voices heard. 
Okay. Uh, I can definitely do that. So I went down to my breakout room and there were about 300 people, most of them standing up and about 70% of them were men. Wow. And I was floored by that. Uh, so what I was going to talk about suddenly seemed <laughs> beside the point, you know, telling these men how they could, you know, get noticed by men. I mean, it made no sense. Right. So I, uh, I asked, the, you know, I asked people in the room, why did you come? Why did you choose this segment? And what I heard was not unexpected. You know, we have a more diverse workforce and we're not doing a very good job of attracting and retaining, especially women. And uh, we want to get better at that. But then this one executive stood, he owned a construction company and he said, look, please do not waste your time telling us why we need to get good at this. We understand, we get it. In other words, don't build the business case, but we we don't know how to do it. We don't mm. have a clue. So I thought, okay, that's what my next book is going to be about. Uh, is very tactical and specific ways that companies, organizations, teams, leaders can individuals can use to right. build a more inclusive culture, what's increasingly called, and I love the term, a culture of belonging. Belonging. What are the practices, what gets in the way, how can we address it in order to move forward? Because diversity is the reality of the workplace, but inclusion is the only effective means by which a highly diverse workforce can be led. Absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more. And having read your book, I have to say, you know, the two things, well, there's probably multiple things, but at least two things that jumped out at me immediately. And I think about our coaching audience and how to frame this in terms of usability for coaches in particular, right? Is that you, take a very behavioral approach, very practical. Like, yes, it's great to build your self-awareness. And we've all done as coaches work on emotional intelligence. And you don't take away from the value of those self-reflective experiences, but you really push towards action. You know, it's the way you act in the workplace that then reverberates, becomes a habit, and ultimately changes the culture. And I think that's really, really profound. And then the second thing, and I, I'll stop because I want you to comment on both of these, but the other thing that's really jumped out at me with your book is that you touch on some pretty taboo topics. You talk about humor, which is something that is not easy. And you write about it in a beautiful, very respectful, but really powerful way. And also workplace attraction, like, Whoa, okay, now we're getting into the dirt nitty gritty. Um, so for those of you who have not read this book, you're in for a treat. These uh, Sally does not shy away from some of the key themes that you know are, are sort of always hidden in the background, power and gender dynamics and attraction and humor. And so I'll, I know we have a very short time, good news, is we will get to see you again next week for a longer, deeper dive. But I'll let you choose what, because I mean, the topics were so interesting and so relevant. But I wonder, did you have some hesitation yourself? Like, how did you choose to go for it around some of these more um, sensitive topics? I chose to go for it because nobody's going for it. Um, <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's so much hypersensitivity. Uh, in the workplace. There's so many things that we cannot mention. There, you know, I see it, I, I, when I coach men, they say, you know, I'm walking on eggshells all the time. What might I say that could offend somebody? Um, we, uh, in organizations, we're primed to, to, you know, focus on microaggressions and what did that person really mean and what is their mindset and what kind of unconscious bias might they have? And so I felt that the environment is, on one hand, too hesitant, and yet we're living in a culture 
where people say the most outrageous and horrific things. Right. So it doesn't quite make sense. And I wanted to be very, you know, I'm, I've been at this a long time. And I thought, if I can't talk directly, if I can't bring up stories like the story at one of the stories I have in there where a senior, well, he actually was the owner of a small company. He got into the elevator, 78 years old. He's been married forever. He got into the elevator. One of his more recent hires, it's a 24 year old woman, got into the elevator. She had had hair down to her waist. Suddenly it was this short, as short as mine. And uh, he looked at her and he said, oh, nice haircut. And they got off the elevator. And that afternoon, he was visited by her and four other women who told him he had crossed a line. Wow. He had demonstrated he had no respect for women, that he was so retrograde. He didn't understand that you do not ever comment on anybody's looks. And, you know, you never would have said to a man, nice haircut. He said, well, actually... If a man had had hair down to his waist and suddenly walks in with short hair, I probably would have said, nice haircut. Didn't work. They kind of put him on notice, went to HR. I mean, it was, you know, this idea of being primed to, to identify unconscious biases. I don't think it served us. We spend too much time focused on what's going on in people's minds rather than their behaviors, their speech and their actions, but people are hesitant about, about how to behave, about how to speak. You know, it's a highly, highly diverse workforce that we're right. one of, you know, whether it is in terms of gender, in terms of race, in terms of sexual identity, in terms of age, in terms of values and experiences. And we all need to find a comfortable way to operate in this where we can be, you know, to some degree authentic, balance that with being professional, very important, and a sort of a guide for how we can best create strong relationships in this kind of culture, because that will serve us. It will improve our own experience of work. It will enable us to be allies really be allies you know people are every time i turn on twitter somebody's going be an ally okay fine how, how you know what are some ways we right. can do this so i've you know in my career i've tried to focus on the how so i i really took it on in a in a rather volatile um em environment we're part of and well um, i applaud you because i think it's bold and i think for coaches it's particularly useful to be aware of um, what you call the, I think there's eight triggers that you talk about in your book. And, you know, these are on one level very common, but they're also areas that we all struggle with. And as coaches, we get into these conversations with our clients and, you know, our job is to stay away from advice for the most part, but to explore and deepen the inquiry. like. Okay, so how do you as the leader create a, a sense of psychological safety or actually reflect on your own behaviors or the behaviors of your colleagues? So I'll let you pick because there's eight wonderful triggers, but share with us a couple of the triggers that you walk us through in the book that connect directly to these themes. Sure. Um, and the triggers are, are emotional. Basically, they're situations people or places that stir in us an emotional reaction, like that young woman on the elevator that stirred right. in her an emotional reaction. So triggers are environmental. We cannot control them. Despite colleges and universities seeking to create trigger-free zones, there are no, no trigger-free zones in our culture, in the workplace. It takes the humans and out of it, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And especially in our communities. So what we need is an awareness that things can happen that may trigger us. And we need a way to deal with them. So in the book, I address very common triggers in the workplace. Visibility, communication, uh, fairness, how we fairness. perceive fairness, how yeah. we build networks, 
Uh, and then, as you say, things like humor and uh, attraction. But fairness is a big one. I'd say that the fundamental ones, in a way, that I hear the most about, and this is both in the coaching I do and the workshops, uh, the ones I hear most about have to do with visibility and fairness. Visibility meaning, you know, this, we're provoked if we're not very good at getting recognized for our contributions and someone else is, that can right. trigger us in terms of it. So we find ourselves thinking, oh, that person's such a showboat or, you know, he's always showing off or, you know, I can't get any air around here, that sort of thing. So we get into these sort of negative <clears throat> personal narratives to explain what's happening. But I've also seen often people who are good at visibility who are triggered by people who aren't. Well. You know, she doesn't seem to have any uh, capability of speaking up for herself or himself. So um, there's nothing I can do about that. You know, they'll have to grow up or, you know, get better at it. Uh, they're not really a player. So we tell ourselves these stories, not really a player, showboat. And what does that do for us? It doesn't give us a path forward. It doesn't give us a way to potentially build a collaborative relationship with a person who's different than we are. We stay stuck in a kind of self-serving narrative about how superior we are to other people, essentially. And uh, we don't have a way to move on. And what I've tried to do here is provide, for example, a way to write alternate scripts that might explain what just happened. Or maybe that person didn't hear me when I said, that or you know maybe the way i phrased it i was you know i was a little bit all over the map let me clarify doesn't matter if we really believe <laughs> our story we're just doing it to give ourselves a way forward so for example and this is so common uh you know a woman says something in a meeting and it doesn't get picked up and then 10 minutes later or five minutes later, a much more senior man says the same thing. But he goes, whoa, what a great idea. So what is she going to do? You know, you're not going to raise your hand and say, that was my idea. That doesn't work. Uh, if you're quick on your feet, you might be able to say something like, oh, I'm so glad you agree with my idea. Not in a sarcastic tone, but right. in a real tone. Uh, but if you're not, you you have a, lots of paths forward. You can grab the person going out of the room. Really glad to hear that you agreed with my idea. I'm wondering if you'd like to get together and see if there's a way we can move it forward. You can do that by email. You can do it on the phone. You can text the person, whatever. What you want to do is by giving them the benefit of your goodwill, not, you know, like they were trying to step, they poached my idea. No one listens to me. Um, rather than doing that, you you reach out to them as a potential collaborator. They've already claimed ownership to some degree of your idea. So you want to put yourself in a path to be part of that. And it, it, it takes, you know, it's, it can be hard to do. And when I suggested it in coaching, people often say, well, you know, but I do think he was trying to just kind of Grab right. credit an idea. Okay, fine. He, maybe he was. Assume he was. Even if he was, don't you want a positive path forward? Don't you want a way of potentially being in on moving forward with this idea? And uh, in doing so, turning that person who you're seeing as an adversary into a collaborator. So there, there's so many opportunities when we are triggered to, to turn it into an opportunity to yeah. um, engage that person as an ally. Right. I think we, I think the, the fairness piece shows up almost in all the triggers. Oh yeah. And that, you know, the neuroscience research and the Neuro Leadership Institute has done a lot of work on this with their SCARF model that fairness is one of those triggers that the brain lights up, you know, when people have a sense of inequity. And I think it's it's never gonna go away. I mean, I think that's a natural tendency of the fact that there's power dynamics, right? And visibility issues. Um, 
and there's a competitive landscape that we are all faced with in our so-called capitalist system. So that's not going to go away. What I love about what you're sharing, though, is number one, to become aware that that's something that we all experience, that fairness comes up for all of us. Even if we are at the top, we still yeah. get triggered by those kinds of things. And then secondly, that the the, the core theme that you're really pushing, and I, I, I think is, is one of the oldest in the book, but is crucial, which is, do you want to be right? Yeah. Or do you want to be effective and successful? Right. And so to have an awareness that, yes, feeling judged or criticized or judging that other person may feel good in the moment, but it doesn't move you forward. And so you give a lot of great examples in the book. And I think that's where coaches can be very helped by reading these stories to help their clients move through that trigger and recognize that at the end of the day, what they really want is collaborative relationships. Yes, exactly. Right. And that's what you're strongly promoting is build your network, align with people, in a sense, get over yourself, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so to speak, recognize that being triggered is human, but it's not going to help you if you pull yourself away or if you then move into a critical mode and make that person wrong. Yes. Or if you enlist other people you know, who you think may have the same issues, you know, can you believe that happened to me again? These guys just don't get it, that sort of thing. We do this a lot with, you know, I, I hear stories about it's not fair from everybody. Oh, it's not fair, only men get promoted. It's not fair, they're only promoting women around here. It's not fair, they're only promoting people of color right now. It's not right. fair, this organization only promotes white people. I hear that you know, those stories about the same organization, so they can't all be true. Right. It's this perception that, you know, we didn't get a fair shake. Guess what? Sometimes that's absolutely true. Sometimes an organization is making a big effort to promote women or people of color. And, um, you know, so someone else gets side sidelined. That's what they're doing. They have their objectives. Sometimes, you know, the old boys network is, is still alive and it's still out there. And sometimes it's not fair operates where, you know, men get jobs that, that women or people of color don't, white men get jobs that women and people of color don't get. So what, what we wanted, and that is one a really fundamental, you know, where we feel like we're, we didn't get a promotion because of something like this. It, it wounds us. It speaks to our self-esteem. We feel that we're putting in all this effort and it's not really valued and recognized. And so, but it's not constructive to tell ourselves this is what happened, unless we're willing to, you know, combine with people, take action, et cetera, bring a case before HR, et cetera, which can blow up in our face. And we right. see that can backfire. Oh, yeah. So, you know, what do we do with that feeling? You know, usually we grab a friend and say, oh, it's so unfair around here. What what what's more helpful is, OK, well, that happened. Uh, this is really painful. I feel very triggered by this. It feels extremely unfair. I'm going to get more information. Why was that person promoted over me? You can ask that person. You know, I, I, I'm very happy for you that you got this job. I wanted it so much. I thought I might get it. Do you have any thoughts about why you got it instead of me. And I have a wonderful story in here. It's too long to go on. You remember the one with the with the apple pie? Oh, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just a great story. But it's uh, it, 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 this woman asked her colleague, you know, I, I can't get over that I didn't get this job and you got this job. I thought I was more qualified than you were. And it really wounds me. I can see you're more connected. They seem to only promote guys around here. Was there something you did? And and he, it was really interesting because what she discovered is the reason he got promoted, and she was able to verify this, really had was not necessarily related to him being a man, but was that they that the company saw him as more of a team player, more of an establishment figure who could manage a project and saw her as more creative. And he said, you know, if you'd like 
to get into a position like this, I can give you some thoughts about how to make that happen. He mm. said, but I'm not sure that that's necessarily where you want to be. And she thought of it and she thought, actually, it's not at all. I enjoy being, you know, on the creative side. Right. So it was very helpful to her. And she built an extremely strong alliance with this guy. And, and they became instrumental in one another's success over the years. So that kind of conversation, it can be so profound. I love that because I think what you're pointing to is really fundamental to stepping out of our triggers and stepping into relationship and realizing that, okay, you're triggered, look for an outlet with a friend or someone where you can release that anger, release your feelings of frustration, and then more productively think about how can you reach out? And you spend quite a lot of time in the book on building a network building collaborations, being part of the solution. And it's actually subtle, but potent because it's not about activism. It's not about, you know, shaking your fists and bringing a, a lawsuit. It's really more about human to human. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I feel like that's the big theme of your book. That's the big takeaway Ooh. that I came with which is we're going to grow together. Rising together is sort of one group, one couple, one small team, one bigger team, ultimately an organization together, seeing each other as all fallible, all human, all in many ways the same. Yes. Right? Exactly. And it's really this idea of giving other people the benefit of our goodwill. How do we right. do that? It's a very, very powerful way of operating in the world trying to give somebody a great example i don't i just got a moment but uh in in the book of a woman who was a, a senior military officer and she had she was at west point but throughout her career she had had an issue of getting more junior men who passed her to salute her and oh i remember that story yeah. yes yeah. To salute her and greet her, which is accepted military practice and doctrine around the world. But they would pretend that they couldn't see her or sort of slink right. by. She said, I, I felt like I knew why they were doing it. Uh, they were doing it because they didn't want to acknowledge a woman could be in a position of power over them. She said, but I decided not to tell myself that story, but to every time tell myself the story and say to them, oh, maybe you didn't see me. Hello, soldier. And then, oh. Yes, ma'am. So uh, greetings, ma'am, whatever they were saying. And she said it was because she was able to give them the benefit of the doubt. She was able to get them to change what their responses are. And they dropped it one by one. And wow. it kept happening. But it was it's the power of giving people the benefit of our goodwill. And it's it's under leveraged in terms of power uh, these days. Yeah, you're just actually making things worse when you hold on to your anger and righteousness. And in many ways, you get then deep, more deeply triggered and the other people get more deeply triggered. And we wind up in camps, which we see on the political spectrum, which we're yes. re where we're really not making bridges. And I think that your book is all about building those bridges by recognizing, and if you're in a coach, by working with leaders to recognize that it's not about them always being right. It's about them creating an environment where they can be effective, like she did as a you know, as a military leader, right? And how to do that? You know, and how to do that. Back to that question at the construction super conference. Okay, I'm bought in, but how do I do it? And this right. is what I was trying to do here with Rising Together, which is super because you do it extremely well. I found it super readable, and the good news is. Um, we're running out of time. Unfortunately, the chat did not come through for me, guys. And I think it's probably the internet. So if it came through on LinkedIn, make sure we uh, will follow up with Sally to make sure if you had any questions, we'll see that she can respond to them. But most importantly, we're going to get to take a deeper dive. I'm going to walk you through all eight triggers next week together. So please join us live. Uh, I think it's Tuesday um, at noon Eastern time. I believe it's, it, I know it's next uh, Tuesday. Let me look at my, 
Uh, it is at, um, I have it at 11. Okay, 11 a.m. Tuesday, Eastern time from wherever you are, join us. And uh, we will take a deeper dive into the triggers. And also I'm gonna ask her about power because there's a whole section in her book, wonderful theme around how to become aware of power, how to use it and how to make it work for you as a potential leader in an organization to be more inclusive. And with thank that, you. I know you need to run. So I'm gonna say thank you so much, Sally. And we'll look forward to seeing you again next week. And thank you all for joining us. And we'll hopefully see many of you also next week at the webinar. So take care, everyone. Thanks for joining us.